yeah, so welcome. Thanks so much, Ayanna, for that little intro while I got us live on Facebook, because we are live on my inspired speaker, my inspired community, authentic communication. I don't even know what it's called. Inspired community, authentic communication, Facebook group. So if you aren't part of the group, it's a, it's a public group. Join us. We talk about speaking. We talk about all sorts of cool inspirational stuff and uh it's not it's not a paid group or anything it's just a public group but uh it's quite fun to be on there and i will sometimes host challenges and that kind of thing so uh do come check that out and a little bit about me just so you know if you haven't met me before my name is daniel benzen and i run the inspired speaker academy so what i do is i work with speakers to be more authentically themselves. My background is not in Toastmasters or Dale Carnegie or anything like that. My background is in the theater. It's in acting and knowing how to use this voice body instrument that we have. So it's slightly different training from what you would normally see in speaker training. It's much more about the psychology of the voice and the physicality of the voice and the breath. And uh, it's quite fun, I think. We have a few people who are clients of mine on the call today. so. You'll get to hear from them a little bit if you have any questions about what it's like to work with me. And um, is there anything else you need to know about me? <laughs> I run a monthly membership. If you're interested in checking that out, you can check that out. I will put the link in the chat. But I also do free vocal needs assessments. If anyone isn't sure, it's kind of strange the work I do. It's hard to explain. You'll see a little bit of it in the feedback today. But if you're curious, uh, it's better to just book a call with me you can pick my brain and then you can decide whether or not it's for you after that there's no uh, no commitment no strings attached but uh it's really cool work it's very powerful work it made a huge difference in my life and that's why i share it with people because i was this very neurotic i trained as an actor as a very neurotic actor and i wasn't good at communicating with people or connecting with them or connecting with myself and this work completely changed that it helped me to get into my body and to get into who I am and how to express that. And so that's why I wanna share it with others. Do we have any questions before we get started? You can just throw them in the chat. Our first speaking spot is at 1045. So we've got time for one question before we get started. If you would like to speak, there are seven speaking spots available for today. And um, Ayanna's got them on a list. The first one starts at 1045. So if you would like to speak, please let Ayanna know. Uh, something that I would like to talk about until someone has a question is this idea of <laughs> this idea of, of not being perfect, especially on video. This has been coming up a lot in my coaching sessions recently. And you know, it's <laughs> it's it's hard because you're you're on video, everyone can see you, and you're like, oh, they could be recording it, they could rewind if I said something terrible, it's out there forever. Um, and it's interesting because pre-COVID, I was mostly teaching offline, I was working with speakers on stage. And it's actually so much more acceptable to mess up on video, which is funny because we kind of think of it as being the opposite, because there's a camera and it's recording and it's there forever. But video is such a much more, it's a much more intimate medium. It's much more human. We're seeing so much more of the person. When you're on stage and you're speaking like in a TED talk or something, it's a very controlled environment and you're quite far away from your audience. And there's an expectation of polishedness that isn't there in video. And so, you know, there's so many people that I talk to are like, yeah, I'm happy speaking on stage. But when it comes to video, I feel all this extra pressure. And I want to say that it's actually the opposite. You know, you don't need to worry so much. And yeah, I mean, don't say something that's inaccurate. <laughs> or if you do, please come back and fix it. But the allowance that we have to be more ourselves, to be more human, to be more quirky, to be, you know, if you're a little bit nervous, it's okay. If you're, I always speak too fast when I'm nervous. And it kind of works on video. And if you're, you know, if you're struggling for what to say, people will stay with you or you can cut it out afterwards. And there's just so much more leeway that we have because it's a more intimate medium, because people are more accepting because it feels more real. It feels more human. It feels more like sitting opposite someone at a coffee shop and chatting to them, even though as the speaker, maybe it feels the opposite of that. <laughs> as the audience, it feels more that way. So I just wanted to address that because 
I think a lot of people who are scared of speaking on video for social media, for their work, for whatever reason, a big part of that is this kind of permanence, this idea that the video is is here and it's more, more exposing and it's more professional and it's it's supposed to be more polished but that's really not the case and that's a wonderful thing it's very freeing we can you know jump on a selfie video on instagram and just make fools of ourselves for a minute and people seem to really respond well to that so i do want to encourage anyone who's kind of thinking oh maybe i want to speak but i don't know what i want to speak about or i'm scared of being the fool i don't want to pressure you or anything, but I do want to say that it's amazing how much fun it can be when we let that go, when we let that pressure go, how much fun it can be just to connect with people online and through video, because it's it's a different way of doing things and it, it can be quite fun. So that's what I have to say on that. Ayanna, do we have any, any speakers yet? Any brave, courageous souls? I haven't heard from anyone yet. <clears throat> All right, so we're waiting, folks. Uh, this is speaker lab drop-in. So the idea is to showcase you and your ideas. If you don't want to speak, that's totally fine. I can talk for two hours. <laughs> I do it all the time, <laughs> but I'd rather not. I'd rather this was more of a, a showcase event for you because this is about helping the community and you know, getting your message out there. If you are brave enough to turn on your camera so that I can see you and talk to you and say hello, that'd be great. We were going to do introductions. So now that it looks like people aren't dropping in and out too much, why don't we do that? My name is Danielle Benson. I run the Inspired Speaker Academy and I help people to find their full expressive voice and to let that out and share it with the world without self-sabotaging with nerves or with self-judgment or with any of the physical things like a smaller voice or a stammering voice or not loud enough voice. So that's what I do. And that's who I am. I'm going to invite Sam to undo your, undo your video, to turn on your video and unmute yourself and introduce yourself, please. Sam. Some, so, what, so for some reason I cannot unmute, I cannot uh, show my video, start my video. Oh, do you want me to do it for you? Yes. I um let me see if i can say you cannot start your video because the whole oh has you know what i screwed something up earlier that's my fault thank you for pointing that out that is my fault i'm busy here complaining that no one's turning on their video and it's my fault can you do it now let's see sorry folks i'm still learning this is yeah. only my fourth time doing this it, it's working <laughs> <know> by now <laughs> thanks so much sam sorry everyone i didn't realize i'd taken that uh, ability away from you. So Sam, can you introduce yourself? Hi, uh, my name is Sam. I have been taking the course with Daniela Benson ever since the COVID started. It will, I believe the prior, the first thing I would like to learn from them is uh, correct my accent so, so people will understand me more because with the accent is uh, actually take away some of the, my way to speak. And the other one I just realized I need to do is remember look at kind of camera, not anyone beautiful or handsome. That's important. And after that, it will be idea. And what else do you want me to say? Just whatever you wanted to say to introduce yourself. That's pretty good. You feel good? I feel good. As long as no one's throwing eight at me. That's the benefit of doing it online. Yeah, no, no projectiles are going to happen in this call. Although I like potato. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Sam. Uh, Julie, you are next on my list going round. So do you mind, Julie, do you mind turning your camera on yet? I know you were getting ready when you joined the call. Okay, sure, sure. Just, <laughs> Just introduce yourself, then you can turn it off again. Okay. Okay, I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> Just to, you know, get you feeling self-conscious. Hi. Hi everybody, my name is Julie and I um, I have a full-time job but I'm just getting ready to go into my master's and yeah so that's a new thing. I have a business called The Connection Pathway but my master's will be helping me become a registered clinical counselor. 
So that's an exciting new direction that I'm going towards. And I got fully admitted. So now I just have to wait till fall of um, 2021 and then I'll start at Adler University. So that's, that's what I'm doing right now. And I'm just, uh, I saw this opportunity to join this uh, video call today. And I figured there's probably going to be lots of class presentations and it, a different medium of communicating with my peers and cohorts in the future. So mm -hmm. um, I recently did a Thompson Rivers University course and I had to do a class presentation and it was a very personal topic. And I noticed that because of the subject matter, I, my voice was shaky, but I did get through the whole thing. But that was where I was like, OK, I mm -hmm. have done a lot of uh, public speaking through an, or, an entrepreneurial organization in the past. But I guess when it's a sensitive subject matter, now I'm learning it's it's probably something that is worth strengthening on my own. So that's why I thought of Danielle and when she invited me for this and I was like, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> Perfect timing. I love it. It's so true when something is, you know, you talk about something that's not like super personal to you and it's so easy and you're like, I got this. This is amazing. And then you start to talk about something that really means something to you and all the nerves come up, the emotions come up and it's, it's a very different experience. I, I hear you. I feel the same. So I'm, I'm glad you're here, Julie. Yeah. <laughs> and also we have a couple of people in our membership at the moment who are doing presentations at school, but it's all on zoom, right? So that's also a different medium. It's very different from standing up in the front of the classroom and speaking, doing it kind of, in your living room on your laptop is a different experience as well. So yes, for sure. <laughs> thanks so much for being here, Julie. Thank you. And Clara, you're next on my on my screen. Do you mind uh, introducing yourself? Hi, can you hear me all right? I can hear you perfectly. OK, so hello, everyone. Nice to meet you. My name is Clara White. I'm an economist and a political scientist, and I am also the executive director of Padea Mundi, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to promoting culture, arts, and humanities. So that's what I'm doing at the moment. And I met Daniela, I think a year and a half ago. And I like the training that she's giving because I need to learn to um, make better presentations and also gain some interview skills and Danielle is progressively trying to improve my oral communication skills, for which I'm very thankful. So that's why I'm here today also. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Clara. June, you are next on my list. Are you comfortable? Are you in a place where you can turn, off your, turn on your camera? Yeah. First of all, can you hear me, though? I can hear you perfectly. OK. Yeah, sure. No problem. Um, yeah, I did uh, turn on my camera, but um, it's black for some reason. Oops, I think. It's, oh, it's maybe covered. Sorry. Is it covered? <laughs> I do that too. It's a good idea. Yeah. Hello, there you are. <laughs> There's your face. Hi. Hi. Hi, Al. It's nice to meet you. Hi, Daniel. Uh, it's been long, but yeah, it's great to meet you guys. I'm June Sanyal, and um, like uh, Daniel has been incredibly helpful in vocal workshops and everything. And currently I'm um, looking forward to becoming a, a certified teacher. And I love two things. Um, one is teacher teaching and tutoring on a like a volunteering basis and also music. So like if anyone is interested in um, you know, uh, for any tutoring lessons or kinder, I mean, uh, secondary on a secondary students level and while mu listening to music. Hi. So <laughs> just uh, feel free to get in touch um, at the end of the session. I love that idea that the, the, the tutoring always comes with a background of music and different music for different subjects, maybe that would be quite fun. Uh. Yes. <laughs> Otherwise, it, it gets really boring, right? Yeah. yeah. No, I love it. It's a great way to yeah. stimulate different different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks so Sorry. much for being yeah. here, June. And no we have Forrester. My pleasure. Thank you. Uh, Forrester, are you able to, are you feeling comfortable enough to turn on your camera and introduce yourself? Yeah, Hi. of course. Hi. 
Nice to uh, nice to meet everyone. I'm Forrester Whitney. Um, I am an aspiring entrepreneur, and with that, uh, with that direction that I am currently deciding to go on, uh, the idea of pitching and the idea of storytelling is kind of in my realm of things to uh, improve upon. And with that, I find that I struggle with uh, with with like, like with eye contact and creating content, generating content at the same time. Um, yeah, so this is kind of like my intro to, to speaking and just kind of being in an environment like this. So thanks for having me. Thank you so much for being here, Forrester. Uh, that is, it is difficult to maintain eye contact and think and speak all at the same time. How do people do it? It's like chewing gum and walking. How do we do it? Uh, so this is a little bit tricky to start off, uh, one of, uh, one of the people I work with a lot who isn't here today, but I'm going to give her a shout out anyway. Uh, Melody Owen of Nutritious Truth talks a lot about client stories and business stories and different ways that you can use storytelling in business. So we, when it's your spot, we can totally talk about that. And um, also, I would recommend checking her out. Uh, Melody Owen. Oh, I don't know what her website is because she just changed it. But uh, Melody Owen of Nutritious Truth Publishing. Uh, she is Author Nation is the name, I think, of her author group, but she also teaches business stories and she's very, very good at it. So I would recommend you check that out if, if that's something you're interested in, Forrester. Thank you for being here. Yeah. Could I get her name one more time? Oh, yeah. Um, actually, Ayanna, can you just type it in the chat? Uh, yeah. And I, I don't, I think it's MelodyOwen.com is her uh, website, but Ayanna will put her, put her website in the chat and I'll also put it on, this is being live streamed on my Facebook group. I'll also put a comment in there and I'll send it. I'm also, and <laughs> I'll send you a thank you email and I'll send it in there as well. So you'll have the link, I promise. It will not get lost. <laughs> Thanks so much for being here. Amazing, amazing. So do we have a first speaker yet, Ayanna? You're on um, mute, love. Yes, yes. Um... Uh, Cl Clara. Clara. She Great. Speak. I'm just going to, I'm just, can you just fill her out on the list that we have, Ayanna? Just so that I can see what's going on. Awesome. Fantastic. So Clara, you are going to speak first. This is exciting. So we're going to give each speaker five minutes to speak. And then they get five minutes of feedback from me, which is optional. You don't have to take the feedback if you don't want it. Uh, and I'm going to time it to make sure that I stay on time because I am so bad at staying on time. Clara, you sent me an email of questions you wanted me to ask you. So I'm just gonna find that. So Clara and I have worked together before, just so you know. Um, so she sent me some questions. We've been working on her interview skills because she's launching this amazing program and she wants to get good at talking about it so that when different news companies ask her to talk about it, she's totally ready and prepared. Amazing, so we're gonna get her ready for our media, media exposure. So Clara, is there anything in particular you want feedback on today just to kind of prime us? Do you want feedback? And if you do, what would you like feedback on? Yeah, I think we were working on breathing and trying to talk slower and breathing more in depth. Mm -hmm. so the sound would come more from from the belly than from the throat, right? Correct. So that is what we were working on. So that's what you want to keep working on. Uh, yes, please. Amazing. And um, as far as I'm going to be the only one who gives verbal feedback in these calls, just because it is an uncontrolled environment, we want to keep everyone safe. But uh, if anyone has any written feedback, if you want to just kind of say something nice to Clara, um, just throw it in the chat. What are your kind of priorities about how you'd like to come across as a speaker, Clara? Um, professional, I suppose, and interesting also, hopefully. So people feel like uh, participating in our programs. I've, I've had to change my device, so I wanted to put the, uh, the website of the organization in my name, but I don't know how it works on this device. Oh, okay. So I put it in the chat. Yeah, I actually, Ayanna, can you you can change people's names, right? Um, so if, if Clara, if you can write Pade Mundi, because I know that it's difficult to spell, 
Can you, if you can throw that in the chat, then Ayanna can throw it on your name if you're having okay. trouble with your device. Okay. All okay. right, so I'm gonna set a timer for five minutes and we're gonna do interview style with Clara because that's what we've been working on in Practice Lab. So Practice Lab is kind of like this every six times every month. I hold a two and a half hour drop in for my clients and we work on something for 15 minutes each. So it's just a little bit more than once a week and we get together and we work on presentations or interview skills or whatever people are working on. Uh, and it's something that I offer for my membership clients. So that's what Clara and I have been working on and we're gonna continue doing that. So this is really great. You are on a public platform with a lot of people who don't know you, unlike Practice Lab where everyone knows your name. It's like that cheers bar. So I'm gonna start the timer and I'm gonna get you to breathe into your belly, sit up straight, breathe into the belly, really ground your breath, fill your belly up with air, out on an F. And again, fill your belly up with air and out on an F. And every time you breathe, I want you to take a lovely, slow, beautiful, big breath into the belly to help ground your voice and ground your energy. So Clara, can you tell me a little bit about who you are and where you come from? So... Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Clara White, and I am an economist and a political scientist. This is my background. I have worked for 20 years in those areas. And I have recently created a nonprofit organization named Fadea Mundi. And its mission is to create an ethics of thought and action towards all human and living beings on this planet. This through the promotion of culture, arts, and humanities. Amazing. So where did the name Padea Mundi come from? So Padea is an ancient Greek word. It referred to the culture that the Greeks um, aspired to transmit to their children so that they could become good citizens and be involved in the right way in the life of Greek cities. And mundi is a Latin word which means of the world. So if you would translate it, it would give something like culture of the world. And that gives a sense of what we're trying to do because we are precisely trying to develop this ethics of thought and action relying on different cultures of the world and adapting ancient concepts to novel challenges that we're facing nowadays. So it sounds like Padea Mundi is uh, about educating people on a cultural level. Why, why is this your mission? Why is this, why is this important in the world today? Um, Precisely, I think it is important because we are facing new challenges. We have new scientific and technological tools which we didn't have in the past centuries. And those raise a series of issues. They can both improve human life and the, life, the lives of other living beings on this planet, but they can also um, destroy it, destroy those lives or enslave those lives. So the challenge for us today is for all of us is to create a new ethics that takes into account those new challenges, those new tools that we have at hand, and that enable us to move forward in the, in the future in a positive way, using those tools for the best and not for the worst. So this is why I think it is important. And that's where culture, arts, and humanities can really help um, develop sensitivity, develop values that will enable us to use those technologies, those new scientific concepts in a proper way, in a way that will um, form good citizens, better citizens and a better life for all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So these are very big concepts, you know, culture and, and ethics and, and civilization. How is your organization structuring the way that they're going to reach people and work with people? So first of all, uh, we structured it into two programs. We have a research program 
what could be called a think tank program, which aims at developing these new ethics and um, thinking how it can be implemented into public policies and the, the public sphere in general. On the other hand, we have an educational program which will be aimed at giving, first of all, giving people the foundations in humanities so that they can um, put their assumptions into questions, question the world around them, possibly improve their action thanks to this new knowledge. And um, we will also obviously transmit step by step the, the research that we're doing on the think tank side also. So giving foundations, relying on ancient um, cultural masterpieces and authors, and also bringing forward the new ethics that we're developing on, on the research side. And so what programs are you offering currently? So we are beginning our activities with webinars, cultural webinars. Uh, next Friday, for example, we have a webinar coming up in French on, on uh, ancient Greek poetry of Aristophanes and mostly on the wasps of, from Aristophanes. Then later on May the 21st, we're going to have another webinar in English this time on the concept of human nature in Confucianism, more specifically in Confucius and in uh, Mengzi, Mencius. Uh, both are given by very skilled and uh, very dynamic students. So I'm sure both seminars are going to be very interesting. You're all invited to join. Uh, outside from that, we're developing a fourth curriculum uh, going from antiquity to modern ages in history of political thought, in literature, in different subjects uh, that will be aimed at giving people the foundations I was talking about previously so we can have good discussions on ethics and how to improve our actions in the world, etc. Amazing. And, uh, so final question, how do people join? How do they, how do they attend? So I would encourage you to visit our website which name you can see at the bottom of my picture here on the screen. And once you're on the website, you can check our activities. We have, the website is both in French and in English, also in Spanish and Portuguese. And you can also join our newsletter so that you will be regularly informed of uh, the development of our activities. We're also gonna have classes in ancient languages and endangered languages, so that's Latin, Greek, Sanskrit and uh, endangered languages would be indig some indigenous languages, um, some Celtic languages. So all of that you will find in on the activity page of our website. Thank Super you. cool. So we went just a little bit over five minutes, but we were just wrapping up. So I let it go. How did it feel, Clara? Good. Thank you. Because I'm getting so much help from you. <laughs> <laughs> very eloquent, very... Um... Clara's, Clara's kind of got the superpower. She's really good with gestures uh, and it really helps bring your voice to life and it helps separate because you have some very complex topics. And so your gestures really help us to separate these more, these, these big words that you use, it helps us to follow along with you. So uh, that, that's really great. Um, I wanted to ask you something. I've already forgotten what it was. How did it feel pacing wise? Because I know that's something that we're working on. Um, I have tried to slow down, but I don't know how it sounded to you. <laughs> well, I encourage people to let Clara know in the chat if she was what her pacing was like for you, because everyone is different and I am only one person giving my opinion. In my opinion, it was great. I thought that it was it wasn't going too fast. You were separating the ideas with the breath, the way that we've been working on doing. And you were doing that in a very mindful way, it felt like to me. A couple of things, and these are really tiny things. Clara and I have been working together for a while, so I'm going to get very into the weeds here. The, one or, once or twice, I noticed, and it wasn't often, but once or twice, you used and as a way to kind of keep the sentence going when you really didn't need to, when it could have been like the end of a sentence and a new sentence. And sometimes it didn't, it didn't turn into something bad. You caught it and you dealt with it. It's just something to be aware of because a lot of us, 
when we're starting to feel like we want to say everything on one breath and we want to start speeding up and is one of those words that we use to link sentences together and then I did this and then and then this is going to happen and then this and then this and it never stops you didn't do that but you kind of almost did a couple of times <laughs> so I just wanted to let you know to be aware that that danger is there but you didn't fall into the trap so well done your tone is sounding really nice you're you were much more in your body today then sometimes you're a little bit more strident, a little bit more in your upper register. You are much more in your body today. Every now and again, there's a little bit more up speak than I would want, but maybe 5% more than I would want. Not, not a whole lot too much. Um, so that was nice to hear as well, because I know up speak is one of the things that we've been working on. So it came up once or twice, but it wasn't hugely distracting. And um yeah, you, you were breathing really well. And your passion, when, when you're learning something new and you're really focusing on breathing, your passion was a little bit less today than usual, although it did come out once or twice and it kind of came out and said hello. And then you were focusing on the breathing again. I'm not worried about that because you are so passionate that when you get comfortable with breathing more consistently, your passion is going to come out and hit us in the face and no one's going to be able to get away from it, which is wonderful. Uh, you, you are so excited about what you do. It was a little bit, not muted, but just kind of, it was put to the side a little bit today because you were focused. But I think that's a necessary part of the learning process. We can only, we can only work on one thing at a time. So uh, I feel like you did amazingly well. Is, is there any kind of questions or anything specific you want feedback on, Clara? Um, uh, yes, please. Uh, did my voice sound to come from the belly or from higher how how did it sound yeah much more from your body today it's kind of hard to tell exactly where with your microphone and with the zoom but um definitely much more from your body kind of maybe more from the chest kind of chest torso area than the belly but it was much much less in your head much less in your throat and your shoulders, much more in your body today. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Danya. Thank you so much, Clara. Thank you for going first. Thank you for being brave and going first. I know it's always a little bit scary. Being like, oh, what is this feedback gonna look like? Oh no, Danielle's gonna tell me what she thinks. Uh, I'm not, I'm not that scary. <laughs> I hope. Uh, Ayanna, do we have any more speakers? At this point, you're on mute, love. No volunteers just yet. <laughs> no volunteers just yet. I just realized I've pinned you, Clara, so I'm gonna unpin you, otherwise it's just gonna be the Clara show. Not that you're not wonderful to look at. So no volunteers to speak just yet. If anyone wants to volunteer, you're no pressure. You don't have to speak if you don't want to. Um, I know that Steve is gonna join us later and he, he wants to speak. Um, if anyone wants to try out something, we can do interview style. We can do, you know, you can try out a presentation that you've been working on. You can just tell us a little bit about, you know, your elevator pitch, like who are you and why you're here and what you want to do. Uh, and we can work on that together. There are no rules other than the obvious kind of respect, respect each other and no hate speech, that kind of thing. But there are no rules about what type of speech you want to do in your five minutes you can do whatever you like i um i try in my drop-ins and in events like this for it to be very much you focused this is about what you want to work on i have courses for what i want to work on i have whole <laughs> i have whole trainings designed to my agenda so things like open house and things like practice lab they're much more about your agenda so uh, if anyone does want to speak, please just let Ayanna know. Just tell her in the chat if you would like to speak and she will put you on, she and I have a list for the speaking slots and she'll put you on the slot and um, then uh, we'll get you going. So uh, does anyone have any questions? So putting speaking aside for a second, does anyone have any questions about speaking? I know Julie, you talked a little earlier about a wobbly voice. Did you want to talk about that for a sec? while we wait for a speaker? Sure, I, actually, I I could go into, um, it's an unrehearsed activity that I wanted to, I, I have gone through it 
a couple of years ago. So <laughs> it's something I'm familiar with, but um, is this fine to work from? Absolutely, absolutely. I did see Sam just beat you to it for the next speaker spot. So yeah, you're gonna have to let Ayanna know because uh, Sam's gonna go next. But yeah, absolutely, yeah, bring whatever. Did you okay. have a question before we went into the speaker spot? Um, I guess, could you just go over the breathing and the pacing, just like a little tip to keep in mind? <laughs> sure, just, you know, everything. <laughs> <laughs> a, nice, a nice, simple question. Absolutely. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about breathing and pacing. Then we'll have Sam as a speaker and then we'll have Julie as a speaker. Um, because I want to, I want to honor the first come first serve thing. And, uh, he was telling Ayanna that he wanted to come. So, Sounds good. um, yes, breathing and pacing and how on earth that all works. So your breath is what fuels your voice. Your voice doesn't exist without your breath. So, in order for people to hear me, in order for my voice to get to people, I need to be using the voice and the breath in tandem together to get across to people. Now, what most people do when they're not feeling safe, they're not feeling comfortable, is they separate the voice from the breath. And that can end up like I'm just really holding my breath back while I'm speaking. And that kind of turns into this very uh, stop and start kind of feeling. Or they breathe out and then they try and talk on no breath after they've breathed out. And that kind of also sounds a bit weird. So the idea is to bring the breath and the voice together so that as we're speaking, the breath and the voice are coming out as one. When it comes to pacing, the biggest challenge that a lot of people face is that they're breathing very shallowly. They're breathing up into their shoulders. And so if I'm breathing in this very shallow breath, only a little bit of breath is coming in only a little bit of breath is going out and it kind of tends to feed the nerves rather than calm me down. It makes the nerves more intense. And so if I'm breathing very shallowly and then I'm speaking and then I can get a little bit more tense and I can get a little bit more stressed and I'm going to talk a mile a minute because I've got a lot of words coming, but there's not a lot of breath coming out and a lot of bad habits can come from that. I'm oversimplifying horribly. <laughs> To breathe in a way that is going to allow you to calm yourself down as you speak, to feel more confident as you speak, and to pace yourself in a way that allows your audience to understand you better. Breathing into the belly, into the lower torso, into the, I call them the floating ribs, the rib case, the ribs right at the bottom of the rib case that aren't attached to the, uh, to the sternum. Anything kind of below your diaphragm, feeling your breath down there is going to really help you slow down and also feel more confident because what you're doing is you're actually using the diaphragm fully. And so we're bringing in a lot more breath. And so we have more life for the voice. We have more of a vehicle for the voice. And so if I breathe into my belly, it's a nice big breath. I have a lot of breath capacity. I have a lot of power for my voice to come out. If I'm breathing into my floating ribs, I have a lot of power to my voice if I'm breathing to my floating ribs, sometimes too much, depending on <laughs> the situation. So it's about letting the breath come further down into the body. It also really helps with resonance because if my breath is kind of stuck in the top of my body, I tend to only speak through my throat and through my head when my breath is kind of more shallow. Whereas if my breath is coming deeper into my body, then my entire instrument is available and you hear more of my tone more of my resonant tone did that answer your question in like a really short amount of time Julie yes that was great thank you <laughs> just a you know a short overview of everything yeah, uh fantastic you. super so Sam I believe you want to do interview style for your speaking spot is that correct you are correct awesome I am going to ask you to turn on your camera I did oh there you are perfect love it I'm just going to pin your... I just move myself taller so you can see what left or left of my hair. <laughs> what do you mean what's left of your hair? You've got lovely hair. You don't look because like... Because I'm on 2D right now. Oh, okay. You've kind of combed it all forward. Yeah, okay. Thank cool. God for calm over. <laughs> Funny guy. All right. So we're doing interview style. Sam, is there anything in particular you'd like to work on when, when um, we're doing the interview? Since this is an interview, it's more like candid. So yeah. I just work on what I'm talking about and then start to defer from there. Okay. Hopefully, 
because I wear like I probably it's time to polish up my interview skill if I want to look for the other job. Absolutely. So something that Sam and I have been working on because he's also been coming to my practice lab uh, is slowing down and speaking more mindfully because and this is very typical for anyone with an accent of any type is that your brain is going much faster than your mouth and so. Typically, we want to speak faster, and when we're speaking faster, the muscles of our mouth aren't going to finish words, especially if they're not sounds that feel normal to us. They're your muscles are going to kind of cut corners, essentially. Your your mouth muscles are going to cut corners if you speak faster. So the slower and more mindfully you speak, the more you can really focus on your articulation, because. Accent is kind of divided into two parts. There's the articulation part, which is the consonants, the T's, the D's, the S's, and then there's the vowels, which is more of the shape of the the accent. Focusing on the consonants is the easiest way and the fastest way to clean up your speech a little bit, so that people can hear you. Not only true for people with accents, also true for people who just mumble. So, um, so we're going to focus on slowing you down so that you can mindfully finish words. Especially the ends of words, T's and D's, and things at the ends of the words. So, Sam, I'm going to ask you if we're talking about kind of a performance review or job interview kind of setting. If you wanted to get a promotion, or uh, if you wanted to get a different type of position, what would you say your strengths are as an employee? My strength as an employee is I, when I help the customer, I will listen to them. And if I realize the customer do not want to listen, I will stop first and then f- find another chance to see- speak to them. If they are, w- if I find out they are really interested, I will co- continue with, with the conversation a bit more. Hopefully, it will lead to a referral to my colleague to close the deal. For example, open a bank account, or as you know in Vancouver, it's about mortgage. That would be one thing I would be willing to, I, I'm good at white now. Nice. So I love that because it took me a little second to unmute. That was actually perfect because it kind of forced you to go, oh, I shouldn't end there. I should say something else. When we're doing an interview, typically it's really nice to, especially if you find, oh, I don't know what to say next. I think I've finished talking. Just to summarize what you just said and just to give it a really nice closing. So you did that beautifully. Uh, Probably because I just kind of left you, <laughs> but it, it worked well. So your pacing is nice. Really focus on the, the final consonants, the final sound of a word like mortgage, um, colleague, uh, instead of colleague, colleague. Really um, complete the words, and so that's beautiful strength. What are your like? What is your one of your weaknesses as an employee? I would say my weakness right now is like, for example, administration is something that I still need to work on. But however, I as I my job record in the same company for three years, I can see myself getting slowly getting better. Lovely. So always bringing in, you know, this is I mean, this is kind of job interview one on one, but it's something that we forget when we talk about our. Weaknesses. Talking about what we're doing to make them better is, like you just did, is also a really good idea. So tell me a bit about who you are outside of work, Sam. What do you do in your free time? What are your hobbies? What are your interests? My interests always change. Uh, right now, I recently I found there's a, a movie filmmaker called Jackie Tati. It's it's a fan. Film from the properly from the forty to seventy, is a film that have a really little dialogue, but a lot of you need to watch. It's like Mr. Bean, but in a grand scale. It's a lot of action, not the kung fu or car crash and action, but at the same time is. It's quite enjoyable to watch it once again and again. At the same, uh, how, however, what I feel more my hobby right now is going to 
plot this lab and speak to other people and practice my communication skill because I realize that's one thing that I need to improve on. Lovely. So why are communication skills important to you, Sam? Let me let me tell you that way. Have you ever seen a rock speak? The reason that's why we always try to push them aside. Have you ever seen a dog speak? That's why we, sometimes we understand, we give them what we want and sometimes we give them what they want. And why do humans speak? They want to provide a really elaborate explanation about ideal or about sale, for example. That's beautiful. So it sounds like what you're saying is that for you, communication skills and speaking are a way of participating more actively in the world and, and being seen and being taken seriously and getting what you want. Being more proactive to the world. That's the one of the steps. Love it. Beautiful. So uh, what kind of, how would you describe your, oh, how would you describe your, your working style? Like within, within uh, an office or with coworkers or whatever, how would you describe the way you work? I would say I would like to be more calm. Sometimes, however, it's a bit more chaotic, but I'm learning to be more calm sometimes. It's, it's difficult because right now my work environment, I would say more or less is chaotic. So what is your ideal environment? My ideal environment will be more a calm, a more calm environment at, with this, at the same time would be interaction with other people, interaction communication with other people. Because being chaotic is one of the issues that you can quite easily forget, mis misunderstand about what level you need to do. So calm is important to you because you want to make sure that you're, you're getting all the details right and that you're helping someone and you're, you know, crossing all your T's and dotting all your I's and, and doing things correctly. But you don't want the calm of like being in a booth by yourself and never speaking to anyone all day. You, you still want that interactive element. Then you're like, you're, you're exactly correct because I understand I need to learn from other people and I cannot learn by myself. Mm -hmm. So a lot of time we need collaborate, we need feedback. Lovely. It's very important, I think, that you understand what your ideal environment is, what you're, you know, what you're looking for. And hopefully when we when we go for these interviews and we talk to people, they're offering something that is kind of what we're looking for. Um, but even if it's even if it's not, just knowing what your strengths are and what your preferences are help you know, you know. This is my preference, but I'm okay. I'm okay with chaotic if I have colleagues who will help me out. Or, you know, you, it helps you understand what you're willing to sacrifice and what you're willing to com compromise on because you have a strong sense of what you need. So that's that's great, fantastic. How did that feel? Your, your five minutes speaking are up, so we're into your feedback. How did that feel? I feel I need to go back, listen to it, and remember to say it in the next interview, hopefully in a foreseeable yeah. future. You are very, you know, and again, we've, we've worked together before. So I have the, I have the um, advantage of being able to think back on different times that we've worked together. You were very composed and very like letting yourself think something through so that you could speak in a very eloquent way. Your something that you and I have been working on is these abortive sentences, you know, a sentence that starts and then stops halfway through. And I think it only happened once. Most of the time you really finished your sentence. You allowed that flow to continue. You were much more mindful about finishing words. So as far as clarity and understandability goes, I think you're definitely very much improving. Um, and yeah, I thought they were great answers too for, you know, if I was interviewing you, I would feel like you were confident in who you were and you knew what you were talking about. So that's great. 
Um, something much. that isn't really speaking related, but that I want to advise you on is uh, you're very much in the side of your frame right now. And it is nice to not be right in the middle, but it would be nice if you're a little bit closer to About the About one third, right? Well, it's nice for you to, your, your kind of nose to be on the one third line, if you know what I mean. So um, yeah. that's better, that's better. So the, the center of our frame, if we're too centered, in a frame like mine, it doesn't really matter if I'm in the middle because there's kind of chaos. <laughs> it's not completely symmetrical. If something is completely symmetrical and you're in the middle, it's a little bit boring. So it is nice to have a composition of, we, we talk about like triangles of composition in a frame. Mm -hmm. But if I am on one side and my plants are on one side, you know, this, this prime real estate in the middle is just empty. Okay. And that's not good either. So instead of being in one third of the frame, think of yourself kind of just off center. So if this is the middle of the frame, I'm just okay. a little bit to the center. Okay. Yeah, that's that's much better. Exactly. Because we don't want to be uh, we don't want to be like off in the corner because <laughs> framing is like body language. And I, I can't remember who I was talking to about this the other day. Uh, you know, when you're when you're choosing your frame, you're telling a story essentially. And there are um, there are a lot of ways to do that. So um, we've got another speaker, I believe it's Julie. Okay, yes. Hello. <laughs> Sorry, Hi, one sec, I've just got some noise going on here. So uh, Sam, was there anything else? No. Sorry guys, I just need to, um, Sam, was there anything else that you wanted to clarify before we moved on? No, 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 but that's great, thank you. Thank you for giving me the chance to plot this again. Amazing, thank you so much. Sorry, I just got some uh, background noise, but I think it's gone now. Uh, great, so well done, Sam. I, you're you're improving leaps and bounds, and and uh, I appreciate you coming for the interview style and being brave and just being like, I don't know what's gonna happen, but it's gonna happen. So, well done, good for you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so Julie, you are ready? Yes, I am. And we are working on, you're gonna just kind of ad lib off of this thing that you did before? Yeah. I like to ask people, especially people that I haven't been working with in practice lab, because you and I know each other, but from like years ago, yeah. <laughs> years and years ago, I just like to know from you, just so that I'm giving you the appropriate feedback, what is your focus? Like what is important to you when it comes to what you, what you want me to focus on when I'm giving you feedback? Okay, so I, I'm going to be using my hands and gesturing and trying to have my audience follow along and mimic what I'm doing. It's okay. an experiential activity. And so basically monitoring how well I'm able to lead the audience and pace it in a way that they're following and understanding what I'm saying before I proceed. And appropriate use of hand gestures. Okay, great. So it's very, very gesture oriented, very much the exchange between you and the audience yes. is what you're focusing on. Would it make sense in that case, since that's what you're doing, would it make sense to keep us in gallery view and to get to ask everyone if they don't mind turning on their camera yes. since you're trying to get yes. us to in interact with you? And I also have a few questions that I'd like to ask along the way, Amazing. like around three quarters through. So if people were to unmute themselves and just be ready to chime in, I'd appreciate that as well. Okay, so Julie wants some interaction folks. If I, I invite you to interact with Julie. So we're going to give you five minutes and uh, we'll see how it goes. And we're focusing on gestures and audience interaction and whether or not you are able to get us to interact with you. Right. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> All right. So whenever you're ready. Okay. Um, so in my business, The Connection Pathway, I work to facilitate harmony in the home when parents are struggling with having defiant children. And when their children are not engaging, especially um, when they have a temper, the parents are often very reactive. And so this is one experiential activity that I find very helpful for parents to understand at any age. And it also allows them to teach their children who are five years plus how to understand how their brain works and provides an opportunity for self-soothing um, instruction so that they can help regulate themselves 
and take time apart to to reconvene after they're um, able to think fully through <laughs> everything. And okay, so this is an activity called Brain in the Palm of Your Hand. So if everyone's willing, please follow along with my gestures and hold up one hand right now. Okay, so this here symbolizes your brain stem. And if you put your thumb in the middle, that symbolizes your amygdala. Now the brain stem is responsible for your flight, right, sorry, uh, fight, flight, or freeze response. And your amygdala and brain stem work together for that. Now, if you wrap your hand, your fingers forward, this is representing your cortex. And the front of this is your prefrontal cortex. This helps you regulate your emotional control and be able to think critically and rationally. Now, what happens if someone pushes your buttons? You flip your lid. <laughs> and what happens if you're in front of somebody else and you flip your lid? That's right, they flip their lid. And now is this the time to problem solve? Probably not. <laughs> and um, the reason that one person flips their lid in response is because of mirror neurons in your brain. So while, it, while someone else is reacting a certain way, then our brains, because of mirror neurons, process that same feeling within ourselves. And so if someone else is in a really highly emotional reactive state, then that kind of propels the other person to feel the same and respond the same. With that being said, there are actions that we can all do to help regulate ourselves so that even if one person flips their lid, the other person is able to say, no, I see that your lid is flipped, but I'm not gonna engage. <laughs> I'm going to do something different and I'm gonna regulate myself, which may involve just leaving the room and coming back later on when you've had a time to cool down. And now this is the time that we can problem solve. Yeah, so we wanna have our prefrontal cortex engaged in order to actually work through a problem rather than people having lids flipped and bu buttons pushed and not being able to actually accomplish anything and move forward in a healthier place. Now, um, so why do parents try to problem solve when their children are in a flipped lid state? So could some of you um, offer some ideas for why you think, why parents in general might try to problem solve when their kid is in a really reactive state? They want to solve the problem quick without seeing the their children being in a reactive state or they are already in a inactive state or a reactive state already. Yes. Yeah, so they want to try to solve it quickly is what you're saying, if, if, if I heard you correctly. They want to try to figure out the problem. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, they have uh, an idea that uh, our kids are vulnerable in their subconscious minds. And that's why uh, whenever there is a feedback from the teacher who they rely on, they become self-defensive, you know? Uh, so that's how it becomes like this. <laughs> so, yes. yeah, I think that's yeah, the reason. That's They're the very emotionally thing. involved subconsciously, and <laughs> that's not, I mean, they should just trust the teacher in, in, a, in a conscious level, yeah. But, um, so I hear what you're saying, but the question is more so asking why parents might try to solve a problem while people are worked up emotionally, instead of waiting until two hours later, three hours later, when you're mm -hmm. calmed down. Well, I haven't thought about that though. <laughs> <laughs> I could tell you what the reason was, but I, I don't have any solution at the moment. But oh, yeah, I can, think about, I can think about it and maybe I can come up with it. Something. Next 15 20 minutes. <laughs> it was an awesome way of explaining, though. Yeah. Yes. So, some of the reasons I have written here, I can offer you guys. Um, so, some parents might be afraid that they're not doing their job if they don't give an immediate consequence to their child misbehaving. Let's say you're at a grocery store and your kid takes a candy bar and throws it on the ground and they're really upset. 
Now, if a parent yells at their kid right there, as opposed to putting the, like, let's say helping the child pick up the candy bar with their hand, putting it on the shelf and saying, okay, we're going to leave and go right now. And then in the car, then they go home. And then after they get home, then they have a talk about why that was unacceptable, unacceptable behavior. That's a, those are different ways that parents can react. So my question was, why might parents be reactive right in that moment when their lid is flipped? And it could be from external pressures, like there's other people around and they're worried that they'll think that they're a bad parent because they're not, con they're not disciplining their kid. So there might be external pressures that actually get in the way of parents taking the time and allowing their prefrontal cortex to engage again before actually resolving that problem and helping the kid understand that that's not acceptable behavior. And so that's one thing. So just being mindful of that. And once you're aware of that in the future, that can kind of arm yourself to say, I, I'm not gonna pay attention to what other people think of me, how good of a parent I am. I'm going to do what's best for me and my child. And we're going to work through this on our own pace, not based off of reacting to what other people might be judging me by. Lovely. So, I'm going to, I'm going to stop you, Julie, because we've got over five minutes, blah, 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 okay. over five minutes. Um, but I didn't want to stop you halfway through because, you know, <laughs> you're on a roll. Um, how did that feel for you? I think that was good. Yeah. And I, I appreciate the audience participation as well. And I, I liked seeing people using their hands and gestures. And yeah, so that was great. Amazing. So um, would, would you like some feedback from me? Sure. Cool. I, yeah, I loved it. I, I like the way that you explain it. I like the interactive part. Uh, you're, you're very charming. And I know that this was something that you haven't touched in a while. And I would say that, you know, when you don't remember what to say next or whatever, you know, acknowledging that the way you did, you were just like, uh-huh, well, what am I saying? You know, that is a wonderful way to do that because we can't, you know, the temptation is sometimes for people when they're a little bit you know, they're not as comfortable with their content for some reason. They don't really, do not, they get lost for whatever reason. They tend to try and pretend that that's not what happened. And then everyone's just kind of sitting there going, oh, am I supposed to notice it? Am I not supposed to notice it? Like, what is reality now? And yeah. so, you know, acknowledging, just going, oh, where am I? You know, and just laughing it off is a wonderful way to do it. It also brings some extra energy into, because if typically we tend to get lost when we're starting to get a little bit nervous, and so that laughter can not, you know, hugely apologetic, distracting laughter, but just the acknowledgement and the, that can release some tension and bring the life and the, the joy back into it. So I think you did a great job of that. Oh, thank um, you. As far as facilitation goes, it's always difficult when you're facilitating on Zoom. It's this like, I want, I want people to participate, but how, how do they know who's supposed to speak next? Because you know, not everyone can see everybody and, and all that. So something that I've tried that sometimes works and it sometimes works, not always, is asking people to put up their hand if they have something to say. If you're expecting, because the thing is they're, they're with you, right? And you asked a question, everyone wants to answer, which is where you want to be. Like, that's what you want in the world. But if we were in a room of people where there isn't the sound lag, if someone starts talking and someone else starts talking, they'll both notice and one of them will stop. And there's that kind of automatic thing that happens. But on Zoom, it doesn't because there's a sound lag and you can't always hear when someone else is talking when you're talking. So asking mm -hmm. people to put up their hand and then you can call on them by name. Okay. This makes it a little bit easier because it is a little bit awkward because, oh no, I interrupted you. And then, oh no. And people just, you know, they feel a little bit self-conscious about that. So I would recommend for facilitating specifically online to get some sort of visual cue from people and then to call on them specifically okay. because uh, yeah, the, the sound lag makes it a little bit more challenging. Right. I loved, what else? Yes, yeah, so the gestures were great. I, I didn't really know when I was allowed to put my hands down. Okay, okay. <laughs> I was thinking about that. because That like, was a thing? Activity. We could <laughs> so I was like, I'm doing the activity. <laughs> and now <laughs> can I put my hands down? Now? So that might be part of it. Yeah. Uh, and again, this is like a silly, it's a silly little thing, right? But it's anything that opens a tab in my brain and doesn't close it again means that I'm not with you as much as I could be. Right. Yes. Because I'm, I'm suddenly self-conscious and I'm thinking, am I doing it right? You know, so 
it's a tiny thing and it's not important, but the more we can smooth those things over the better. Yeah. I thought for content that you haven't touched in a, in a while, you looked at your notes very seldom. You were very much with us for most of it, which is great in the future. Cause I know this was very ad hoc in the future. If you are using notes online, it's always better to have your notes open as a document on your computer because kind of faffing with stuff is it's a bit distracting. It's, a bit, it's also loud on the microphone. But again, you, you hadn't planned this, so you didn't know. <laughs> but for, for future, if you do have notes, to put them up on the screen as close to the lens as possible so that you're not physically turning away from your audience in order to look at your notes. Your eyes can go away, it's fine. And then they'll come back to the lens pretty quickly. But the body language of physically turning away from us does have an instinctive we have that instinctive response of like, she's left us for a moment, okay. um, which was unavoidable today. It's just something to think about in the future. Okay. Any other questions about anything? How, how did you guys like the activity itself? And is it a new concept? Is it helpful? helpful? I think this is open to the group. So does anyone have anything they'd like to, to say about that? Did they like the activity? Was it, was it a new idea? So thumbs up if you like the activity. Awesome. And then hands up if it was a new idea for you, it was new, it was new information. There you go, Julie. <laughs> so about, about half people, it was new information. I liked, I liked the way you explained it. It's very much kind of what we do in those areas, very much with different people, because I don't work with kids, but it's what we do is kind of similar in, in the way we help people think about communicating. So I thought it was awesome. Um, Can I add some feedback? Uh, Julie, are you up, open to it? Yeah. Well, um, it's more common than feedback. I think a lot of the feedback I had, Danielle, you've already covered, especially about turning away for the notes. But I thought your activity was very engaging and I thought your body language was very good and I could feel the connection even through the screen so that was awesome and I just wanted to kind of it's more of a comment than uh you know feedback but I actually really enjoyed the activity and I can actually see myself using it in different scenarios um like for example I work with a lot of people with more severe mental health and sometimes that can be a little bit frustrating, especially when you're with someone who has some mental health issues, but they're not severe mental health issues. So sometimes you forget that they still have mental health issues and you talk to them like a normal person. Uh, or I shouldn't use the word normal. <laughs> Careful, Fatima. You know, I know, I know. No, As someone no, who has mental health issues. <laughs> yeah, well, we all have a little bit of mental health issues, to be honest. Um, so normal is not the right word. I apologize. But what I mean is you you kind of speak to them in a way that uh, you think that they would understand information or as an average person would understand information because there's a spectrum of sort of mental health. And mm -hmm. what happens is when people, I guess, flip their lid Mm -hmm. In that communication, it, it, it's a great visual that kind of stays in your mind, whether you're talking to your coworkers, whether you're talking to your clients, whether you're try talking to family members, when you see kind, it, it's a visual, when you see someone put their guard up, you can imagine this activity mm -hmm. and you can sort of say, okay, I need to not react, stay calm, maybe step away and then come back and react to the situation. So the point that I was trying to get across was it's a, it, 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 it created a permanent visual in my mind that I'm actually going to use quite repeatedly. So oh, thank you for that. You're very welcome. <laughs> awesome, so it was, it was very useful. Yes. Uh, Julie, was there anything else you wanted to know from folks before we move on? Um, if I overload it, because I didn't want to run out of time and not properly explain the reason behind it. So I started with an explanation so that people mm. would know where this is going. I felt like that was the right thing to do. And I, I still think that that went really well, the order that I provided information. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I think 
yeah, I was curious because you said you were talking to five year olds and they're like, this is your brainstem <laughs> and this is your amygdala. And I was like, well, uh, but, you know, you you didn't you didn't go into a lot of scientific details. So I think it's fine. And they're just labels. And at the end of the day, the whole point is when your lid, lid is flipped, then exactly. you're not going to think rationally and you use age appropriate language. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So I think, yeah, I was going to ask about that. And then you moved on from it so quickly that I felt it wasn't really, it wasn't going to be an issue. Okay. So yeah, well done. Well done. Good work. Uh, just a reminder that if anyone would like a speaking spot, then please do let Ayanna know in the comments <clears throat> and she will sign you up for a speaking spot. It is 1147. So we've got two or three speaking spots left, depending on how soon someone signs up. Um, yeah. And I just wanted to say that there was something else. Oh, uh, I did want to say this is being streamed live to the public and you all know that you were all told that when you came on the call, but just also, if you are going to be referencing anyone's intellectual property, please do attribute them to say, I learned this from this person because this is a speaking stage. So people are gonna be sharing their ideas and things. And obviously they know this is a public event, so they're okay with you knowing it and sharing it, but always make sure that you do reference the person you learn something from when you learn something in an event like this it's just just common courtesy really to make sure that we are citing our sources as it were it's very easy when we're speaking to just kind of absorb information like that's so amazing and we do want to make sure that we're we're thanking whoever uh shared it with us in the first place so uh did anyone else want to speak or did anyone have a question Oh, it looks like we have another speaker. Very fantastic. Oh, Julie, thank you so much for putting the references in the chat. I would also want to recommend, just as our next speaker gets ready, I would love anyone who has spoken today, if you want to link to your website or you know tell people about a resource or reference something that you've spoken about today, please go onto the Facebook group, the uh, inspired community authentic commun human communication facebook group and go on there and where this replay is just throw in your info because people who are watching this uh if they're watching it live or if they're watching the replay they might want to look you up or you know find what you're referencing so please do comment on the the live stream either now or as the replay and uh, let people know where they can find you and where they can learn more because this is part of this is part of what we're doing here is we're getting your message out there. So make sure it's easy for people to find you. All right. So our next speaker is June, and we're working on your elevator pitch. You said yes. Um, awesome. So oh, thank you, thank you for letting me uh, speak. Uh, it's not that that I have really prepared as I said, like, um, I'm trying. And cool. uh, so, uh, as I remember, uh, just to, um, it's, it's, it should be a, like a 60 seconds thing, right? Like kind of. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> I was actually going to say, if you don't, if you haven't got anything prepared, mm -hmm. what we could do is we could do maybe you do it and then I give you some feedback and then you do it again. And I give you some more feedback because we'll have enough time okay. within the five minutes. And yeah. also, <clears throat> excuse me, I actually have a, a video on this on my YouTube channel. So if anyone's yeah. interested, I have a, a little mini, mini training, little mini training on how to deliver an effective elevator pitch. Yeah. And the elements are always say your name at the beginning and the end. Oh, and it's especially important to say your name at the end, because maybe people weren't listening at the beginning. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and then tell us something about you and remember that an elevator pitch is more about starting a conversation it's not about telling us everything about you so you can share a problem solution like a problem that you solve you can share a client story you can share your background and your ambitions it's nice to have a little bit of a journey so like a problem and solution background and ambitions it's, it kind of gives us somewhere to go and then always include a call to action so a call to action can be vague. It can be something like, I'd love to speak to you further. Or it can be very specific. Like, I would love for you to book a vocal needs assessment with me. Please click the link below. So it can be very specific or it can be very vague. 
depending on the situation. So does that, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, give you an idea of what really, to say? That, that, was, <laughs> that was really helpful. And in that case, um, I think that um, as I like, I, I'm not enough prepared. So I would step back. <laughs> oh no i scared you away <laughs> okay 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 instead may yeah. i may i suggest may i suggest something else yes sure <laughs> i don't want to scare you away that's terrible yeah. so i i do a an elevator pitch mini workshop and in that i do an interview style where because the elevator pitch is kind of the end result right at the mm-hmm. beginning you're you're exploring these things you know who am i what am i good at what what's important to me so would it be useful to you instead of trying to do the end result because we're not there yet would it be useful to you to just answer some questions and start to generate the content for the elevator pitch would you be open Mm -hmm. to that yeah yeah absolutely like like as i said uh, uh, previously i attended the workshop but i could make it only the first day but uh, somehow (laughs) i'm sorry i I couldn't um, attend the second se- session. Yeah, that's I'm fine. Able to do so. I'm sorry about that. But yeah. but definitely, I'll I'll catch up and then and I really need it because you you know right. I'm I'm going to be like I I don't have any ex- pre- previous experience in teaching or tutoring. But in like I volunteered though, but not yeah. professionally. So in that case, I would really like to um, you know n- know how to introduce myself in a very effective way so that the the students or the parents or whoever the audience is gets directly connected to me and feel interested even though I don't have a have an experienced background or professional background yeah so and that fitting that whole thing in a short time it, it is pretty like it it's it it's needs- really tight yeah yes. and the 30 to 60 seconds is only like the time only matters if you're at one of those networking events where they're timing you. Otherwise, it doesn't matter. It's not important. It's just a guide because sometimes if you're going to be an I or something and yeah. they say you have 60 seconds to introduce yourself, they'll make you sit no. down at the end of 60 seconds and you're done. But most mm-hmm. of the time when people say, hey, tell me a bit about yourself, mm-hmm. <clears throat> they don't care how long you speak. Well, they don't want you to speak forever, but they don't yeah. really mind if it's 60 or 90 or 120 seconds. Yeah. So I think I think what might be useful is maybe I just ask you a couple of questions. Yeah, sure. And we yeah. get a little bit closer to understanding what you might put in an elevator pitch. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. So, Thank you for that. Yeah. Hmm? June. Why do you love tutoring? I love tutoring because of two reasons. First of all, when um, I impart my I wouldn't say knowledge, but knowledge and wisdom to someone. And I see that they are absorbing it and they are able to grow. You know, that is the most fulfilling uh, feeling for me. I mean, um, I have worked in office jobs before. I have worked in various like administrative and HR roles before, but this uh, this has been a fulfilling work experience, not like job experience in the sense. So mm-hmm. I have volunteered and this has been an amazing, amazing feeling to me when I have seen that, you know, after the their lessons ended, they, their personalities changed, their, their way of speaking changed. And that's what really inspires and motivates me. Like, as if like I have, you know, I have put the seed of awareness. Now you, you know, go ahead with your life. And that is an incredible feeling for me and I think I can do I I hope I can do well in that uh, in future because um, well I'm I'm sorry to brag but I I have been a very good student in my in my uh, student life and I'm I feel very connected with studies and education and you know research and you know those things like in library basically (laughs) so uh, overall you know, connecting all those two. I think, uh, you know, this is the best reason why um, I want to be a teacher and go ahead. Love it. This. Yeah. Beautiful. So Thank that you. passion. Yes. You know, it kind of doesn't matter what you say. If that passion comes through, that's mm-hmm. that's what we need. That's That's how we get to know who you are and why what you do is important to you is mm-hmm. that feeling that you were just speaking with. So Yes, the words are important, but people don't, re- they're not going to remember exactly what you said. They're going to remember if they understood what you said. 
So we do need to be clear in our communication. But the most important thing is they're going to remember how you make them feel. And so when you are enthusing and you're passionate about it, that's that's what they want to know, really, is they want to know that you have their the student's best interest at heart. They want to know that you're passionate about what you do and that you love helping people. And that mm-hmm. comes across in your delivery. So that, I think, is, is something to keep a hold of. Is that, okay. yes, the words are important, but that passion and that delivery that you just that you just demonstrated is extremely important. There was something else that I wanted to say. Mm-hmm. Um, uh. I should have been writing notes, but I was like, I'm definitely going to remember. <laughs> hmm. uh, okay, I can't remember. It'll come back. I have another question, though. You can let me know, yeah, later. Yeah. So my other question is, uh, what what would you how would you describe your style, your teaching style? Um, I would like to say that I am um, like as I have um, seen myself as a teacher, not as a personal June. Um, I have been very patient and um, empathetic with them. So and kind, basically kind. So they are coming to me with the common understanding that um, they are, they need something, right? So they are lacking something. I won't let that lacking feeling come on in their mind. So I would go with them instead of, you know, leading them ahead. I would like to go with them and that I, I'm, I'll, you know, so they feel that um, I'm not the bossy one, you know, I'm not the teacher one. So uh, that is how I uh, have taught before. And that has helped, Mm. you know, like uh, constant encouraging them, Mm -hmm. constantly encouraging them. No matter what they say, later on, I can, you know, uh, correct and rectify. But for the moment when they are coming up with a positive, uh, you know, feeling that, oh, is this like this? Then I I would make sure that I would rectify in a very... um, intelligent way that I don't say the wrong thing but at the same time I made sure that yes you're right you know so yes this is uh, this is very important and I have I I was successful in uh, one or two attempts and they got good grades 80 percent 90 percent so I was terrific happy so I thought that you know so it sounds like what you're saying is that <clears throat> especially at the beginning it's it's the confidence that you want to build because you know, students aren't going to make guesses. They're not going to try if they don't feel confident for it. So you focus on the confidence first and the positive feedback, just of the fact that they tried, you know, and that they're participating, giving them positive feedback on that. And then working on the details later, but really getting them to be brave in the way that they approach Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And just, uh, you know, I have to keep in mind those negative words. I can't, um, mm. I don't, I don't know. So those words mm. I have to keep in mind and not let them, mm-hmm. you know, uh, uh, get, I mean, I, I want to just take them out, take those out from their minds. You know? <laughs> so that is a part of, <laughs> so that is a part of my um, mm-hmm. plan as well. And that has worked uh, before again. Thank you. Amazing. Me. So, yeah. So how did that feel talking about that? Awesome, <laughs> because this is this is this is something that I want to do. This is something you gave me feedback about, and I I felt so happy <laughs> to be honest. Yeah, <laughs> amazing, good. I do so, it feels great. Yeah. So this is the thing: it's like your your enthusiasm for what you do is very much coming across in this interview setting, and we don't want to lose that enthusiasm when you have like the pressure of the elevator pitch, and that's okay. the that's the the useful thing about these these interview kind of explorations Absolutely. is this is how we choose what to say so yeah you may only have 60 seconds to say something but if you practice just answering the question and speaking from the heart mm-hmm. with me now it's very long form right you're giving examples and you're talking about stuff and we're not going to be able to include all of that in the elevator pitch but the experience of saying it out loud and of giving examples means that you kind of have You have a long version and you have a short version. Yes. And also you can watch this video back because this is being recorded. You can watch it back and take out your favorite words. And maybe there's a word to describe 
you've you've said a whole sentence, but there's a word for it. So instead of saying, you know, I, I you know this, which takes a lot of time, I love sitting next to them and encouraging them and building up their confidence. And you know, I'll I'll sit with them and I'll say, yes, you're doing well. Instead of saying that, you might say, I love to encourage students. So it's the same thing, but you found a more succinct way of saying it because you listen to yourself, you listen to the interview, and then <clears throat> you can kind of digest what you've said okay. and then yeah. Yeah. kind of make it so more succinct and give it back. Words. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> and so that is the that is the the gift of the interview style workshopping. When we're trying to decide something, when we're trying to work on an elevator pitch or a presentation or a talk. Mm-hmm. If you have someone to ask you questions, that's the best. But even if you don't, just pretend, <laughs> pretend someone's <laughs> asking you questions and answer them and record your answers. Mm-hmm. And then from that, you can pick out your favorite pieces because it's coming from the heart. And we never want to let go of that, that enthusiasm and that passion that you had. Something else I wanted to say. Yes, please. I remembered the thing that I forgot. Is Thank you. <laughs> the elevator pitch, presentations, uh, you know, pitching a business or sharing something like we are now on in practice lab. This isn't practice lab, an open house, an open house in public. This is the place to brag. This is not the place to say, oh, I'm so sorry. Not, not to brag, not to sound. That's why you're here. You're here to tell us how wonderful you are. Sure. In conversation, you might want to say, mm, you know, not to brag, but we understand there's a, there's an understanding between you and the person you're talking to. If they've just said, you know, tell me why you're good at what you do or tell me what you do, or there's an understanding that you are putting aside, you know, humility and personal issues for a minute so that you can really communicate what you're good at and what you love. That said, if you ever feel, because you don't want to be arrogant either, and it is a balance. So A, I say own your successes. If you're good at something, say you're good at it. If you feel arrogant, which is not the same as owning your success, but if you're starting to feel like this, this, this isn't true. And I sound arrogant because it's not true. I'm not owning it. Then instead I would say, focus on why something is important to you. So instead of saying, because you can, you can demonstrate something without saying it. Right. So instead of saying, um, I'm really good at building confidence in my students, which might come across as a brag. You could say, it is so important to me that I encourage and build confidence in my students. It's kind of the same thing, but it's coming at at it from a slightly more humble point of view. So if you're not comfortable owning something yet, because Mm -hmm. never lie, just this is my, this is my whole thing. We never lie. So if you can, if you can sit in your success and celebrate it, do that because this is the time. Okay. If if you're not able to focus on the passion and why it's important to you. Yeah. So, so, so finally, I would say that uh, you mean the last, this feedback that you said, the bottom line is that, that I should feel confident about my own success and whatever I've done before. And I should be able to just um, say it, say it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And also, like, I understand you're still, especially when we're learning, especially when we haven't had a lot of job experience we're kind of a little bit nervous to say to say something definite because the experience isn't there and confidence comes with experience. So I would encourage you whenever you can mm-hmm. own it, mm-hmm. own your confidence, but never lie as well. So, you know, there's a lot of people who say, you know, fake it till you make it. If you don't feel confident, just pretend you're confident. In my opinion, that makes everything a lot worse. It makes imposter mm-hmm. syndrome worse. It makes nerves worse this fake it till you make it thing. So I don't recommend that. Yeah. If you can say, you know what? I'm just going to say it. I am good at what I do. And if you can own it, great, good. Do that. That's number one. If you can do that. I think I have to work on that. <laughs> <laughs> if you can't do that, focus on the passion and it will come as you do more experience, as you, as you get better at what you do. And as you have more results, mm-hmm. you'll be able to say more confidently, I am good at this. And I know that because I have these results. It's not opinion oh. anymore. It's just fact. But it's proved fact. It's proved. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Help? Thank you very much. Absolutely. Oh, wow. And I am so happy that it's being recorded and I'll, I, I can hear it later. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so I, much. I find, I find it very useful to record these things. I always record 
all of my rehearsal <laughs> because you <laughs> never know what gold is going to come up and you want to make sure that you've got it somewhere. <laughs> yes, that's right. Thank you very much for your helpful feedback. It's a pleasure, Jim. So we have time for one more speaker for sure, maybe two, depending on how we're doing for time. So um, Ayanna, does, has anyone told you that they would like to speak? If anyone would like to speak, I don't have anyone on my list right now. So if you'd like to speak, let Ayanna know in the chat and she will assign you a speaking spot because that's what we're here for. This is not the Danielle show. This is the you show. <laughs> um, while, while we're waiting for the next speaker to come up, this is probably a good time to tell you a little bit about what I do. You've got to see a little bit about how I coach. This is the tip of the iceberg because this is just feedback. It's not coaching. So what I offer people is I have a monthly membership which has access to practice labs, which are kind of similar to this, much more deep dive, much more private as well. Only six speakers and it's not published anywhere. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a private group setting where we can, we can fail and we can screw around and we can do whatever we need to do, do some exercises to get to where we wanna be. Live practice labs, as well as pre-recorded content. I have trainings on how to be confident on camera. I have trainings on how to overcome nerves when you're nervous, public speaking. It's totally a thing. I have a whole training on that. I have a training on how to prepare a talk. So if you're one of those people who writes out your entire talk and tries to memorize it, and you're tired of doing that, uh, definitely come talk to me because I have a whole course on that. And I have a course as well on how to love the sound of your voice because I think so many of us, you know, we hear our voice back and we're like, oh, ooh, what is that? You know, it's too nasal, it's too soft, it's too this, it's too that. And what we're hearing is we're hearing habits that we have developed over time. That is not your voice. Your voice, the voice that you are born with is a beautiful, expressive, powerful, thing and any true relaxed warmed up voice is beautiful and so if you don't like the sound of your voice it's not your voice that you don't like the sound of it's a habit that you have developed you've done something to your voice and you're hearing that and that's what you don't like and so I encourage anyone who feels like well I have a nasal voice and my voice is annoying and my voice is this my voice is that it's not your voice it's habits that you have picked up over time and just like you can pick up habits you can let habits go so that for me is that's the core of this work for me when I um I grew up in South Africa and my accent was kind of like nasal and flat at the same time and it is really annoying like this is not a nice accent to have it doesn't sound good especially when you're listening to yourself back on camera not to disparage any other South African accents there are some beautiful South African accents out there mine was not nice. <laughs> and part of it was the accent. And part of it was how uncomfortable I was in my body and with my voice and with expressing myself. So communication work and speaking work that touches on the voice body instrument, the way that we do it at the Inspired Speaker Academy, it's not just about what you say. And it's not just about, oh, just you're here. It's not, it is very physical, but it's not only physical. There is a psychological element and there is an emotional element as well because you are a full human being and it's impossible to work on just one piece of you at a time. <laughs> we got to work on the whole human being. And so while I focus very much on the physical aspects of breath and posture and gestures and passion and emotional energy, there are psychological and emotional elements to it. And that definitely comes through in our voice. Our voices communicate so much about how we feel about ourselves and how we feel about other people. So if you're interested in that, please do book a needs assessment with me. Does anybody want to speak? We've got, uh, Ayanna, we got someone here. We've got, oh, we've got Steve and we've got Fatima. Okay. <clears throat> um, well, Steve got for, on the list first. So we'll, we'll work with Steve and Fatima. I'll make sure that we, we have time for you as well. All right. So Steve, what are we working on with you? <laughs> Well, Steve, or excuse me, Daniel, I posted this to Ayana. The basic question is about the, uh, an effective opening on a speech. Oh. And what I'm struggling with always is what you say first, because, and I can give a little bit of a rehearsal of what I've okay. been using. One is, what I've been using is a metaphor and a sports metaphor for leading into a decision that I made in, in life and so forth. Mm -hmm. The other is 
sort of this classic of telling a, a dramatic, well, in terms of the story, okay, so there's this, the one is the metaphor or some dramatic statistic or fact or something like that. The other one that comes to mind is a story. That's a, a second option that comes to mind. And that one, I'm wondering, do you drop into the middle of the dramatic moment in that story, or do you start up with sort of a ramp up to the dramatic moment? And then the third one is kind of this classic, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and mm. tell them what you told them. And I'm always wondering what what's a good opening. And as I said, I could rehearse the one that I've done with the sports metaphor, but I don't know if that's... Uh, the best way to do it or how to even so it, it sounds like you have a question and you'd like to speak i, I i'm if there was time available i'm glad to give my little spiel and yeah okay uh, well right. we do have you in the final speaker spot and it looks like fatima has questions as well so um we'll let you we'll give you a speaking spot and then i'll answer your questions as part of the feedback and then um i'll move on to fatima and answer her questions as well sound good okay very much unrehearsed but unrehearsed okay. is gorgeous we like our right. here. Okay, wonderful. In many sports, there's what's known as halftime. And this is a time when the teams basically reconvene or they take a break and they re-strategize and they get some inspiration from their coach and think about what the second half of the game would be. And of course, many times in sports, there's a very definite period of time in American football. It's 15 minutes per quarter and halftime occurs at 30 minutes into the game. And of course, it can go on more than 30 minutes, depending on penalties and injuries and repositioning the teams and so forth. But you pretty much know there's a clock running down to the nearest hundredth of a second. You know exactly when this is going to happen. Now, unfortunately, in life, you don't know when that clock is going to run out. And about 20 years ago, in fact, I had to, I was kind of, kind of at a juncture in my life where I had to make that type of decision. Of course, I didn't know, you don't know whether or not you're uh, at, the half point, halfway point is coming up where the halfway point is past. But nonetheless, it, it is a time for this sort of thinking about what, uh, what lies ahead or your strategy or re, recalibrating re, re your future type of thing. And what I went through was something that, and I'm, I'm borrowing the title of my speech from a book that I saw called Halftime. And it's by an author by the name of Bob Buford. And during this sort of interim, the subline of his textbook or this book is changing your game plan from success to significance. And it caused me to pause and think about these things. And what I was facing at the time was a decision to go with a, this was a corporate merger at the time, whether or not to go with the new company, relocate to another city or to change course completely. And it took a lot of agonizing thought. And I finally decided at a very dramatic moment, in fact, to say I wasn't going. And I can remember the night in the office building when I had to hit the return key on the computer saying, this is it, I'm leaving the company. And who knows, a very different course proceeded from there. And so the, the, that's the opening. And really what follows then is a number of events and I won't go through the full speech, but describing really three things. One, number one was the, the decision to leave. The second was the experience in leaving. And it turned out I went to graduate school overseas in the UK. I live in the United States. And what that experience was like and family back home and other uh, challenges and so forth. The third component of it was finishing this degree, coming back to the US and very much uh, disillusioned or surprised or met with some uh, unexpected circumstances that didn't fulfill this grand ambition I had. So that's the third component. And then the fourth was kind of coming to terms with it over the years. I returned back to my basic industry and just in recent years have sort of re-engaged with this vision that I had back in, the, in this halftime period. But again, the, the basic question, so I could it seemed like the opening could be what I just talked about using this sports metaphor, the halftime situation, or start with one of the times of tribulation during my education experience with you know, all the doubts that I had or in, in one time arriving, this was in the UK, arriving there at the airport, a dark night and figuring out driving on the left side of the road and all that type of thing. And just a lot of the 
agonizing doubts that I had. And the other would be just simply to say, this is a talk about decisions in life, how, how you should deal with them. This is what I'm gonna talk about, you know, a situation that I faced, the way I resolved it and the way I am now. And that's, that's the way this talk is gonna be organized. So that's kind of what I'm awesome. wondering about. It's really the opening. So uh, thank you for kind of outlining each of the three options for the opening and how it might go. Cause I think it is, th these are difficult decisions to make when we have lots of different options on a talk. And uh, you may not like my answer about how to choose them <laughs> because the answer is it's always context. So it sounds like my least favorite is the tell them what you're gonna tell them, tell them and then tell them what you told them because unless you can make it interesting in some way, it can come across as quite dry. So depending on the content, depending on the situation, that can work extremely well if you're breaking down something very complex. If we're doing a very technical talk and you have to really orient the audience in where they are in the material and how you're gonna break it down, then I think that telling them what you're gonna tell them, tell them and then tell them what you told them, that's what that is for. It's for when your audience really needs an anchor, they really need a map to your talk because it's gonna be quite complex. If the talk is more story-based, more message-based, I wouldn't use that one. I would use the metaphor or the story depending on the purpose of the talk. So what I loved in the first iteration when you talked about the halftime is that you kind of implied that you were gonna bring that back at the end and that was gonna be part of your message so, you know, I'm really glad I took that half time because even though it didn't get me straight to where I wanted to be, I am getting there now. So my best piece of advice would be when choosing your opener, think about your closer and how is the story or metaphor that you're using right at the beginning of your talk going to apply to your call to action or to your message? And that's how you choose. So they're both very effective. A metaphor is very effective. Dropping someone in the middle of a story is very effective. I would always drop them in the middle of the story. Don't give too much context. We always wanna over explain stories and we get to the meat. And that's really the only interesting bit is kind of in the middle of the story. And we spend five or 10 minutes leading up to the part of the story we actually wanna tell. It's a discipline, I do it as well. My storytelling coach, Melody Owen is often telling me what I am telling my students, <laughs> which is cut out the context beforehand and just drop us into the bit we need to know. So it's a very human thing to want to explain, but the less information, the less information you can give before dropping us into the moment, the better when it comes to storytelling. One of my favorite moments, storytelling moments of the very first words of a talk, Melody Owen, who teaches storytelling, I was working with her on a talk about goals setting and her first line was, and so she literally, here's Melody Owen. She's going to come and talk to us today. And so Melody comes up to the front of the room and she says, I'm standing on top of the roof, looking down at the ground and I'm holding a plastic bag above my head and I'm getting ready to jump. Zero context. We got mm. dropped right into the moment, but it's attention grabbing. And that's the point is the beginning of a talk is attention grabbing. We want to set the scene as quickly as possible. So she didn't say I'm six years old and I'm excited to fly. And I wanted to try being Superman. She didn't say any of that. She said, I'm standing on top of the roof and throwing you right into the middle of a story is always the better way to go. Whether to use the story or the metaphor depends on the purpose of the talk, because it sounds like if you're talking about the story, it's going to be more about your education and more about, maybe overcoming trials and tribulations and you know it's worth it it's worth it's worth following that idea of of what you want to do even if you know you don't use it straight away or you know lifelong learning is important or something if that's if that's the purpose and the call and the message of your talk then I would start with the story of going to Edinburgh and getting lost mm -hmm. if the purpose mm -hmm. of your talk is talking about these these halftime moments in life and how they can be important, then I would start with the analogy. Mm -hmm. So it's not mm -hmm. that an analogy or a story that one is better than the other. It's which one serves the message of your of this particular talk. And you might do the same talk with a slightly different message. So, you know, you've got this one talk as an introductory who I am talk, 
and you try it out. You start, you do one with the halftime where the focus of the talk is about, you know, it's important to take time in your life at some point and reevaluate who you are. And then you might do another talk, the same content, but to a different group with the Edinburgh story at the beginning. And then you talk about the importance of education and adult education. And it, it's, it's like the lens that we see the talk through and the, the final message. Does that make sense, Steve? Very good. Yes. Just one, one final question on this dramatic yeah. moment entry. You do reverse back up a little bit to provide some context, surely. You don't like yes. a plastic bag jumping off a roof or whatever. Absolutely. There's some explanation. Right? You just so don't the, start there. So again, you don't start with you don't start with the lead-in part, but you do revert back up and with some context. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Only include what is important that the audience needs to know. But yeah, you wouldn't you wouldn't just say that and then launch into the content. She would she would start with that image of jumping off the roof, and then she would say about her talk was about planning and goals oh, so she would talk about how she didn't have a plan <laughs> when she was ready to jump off that roof okay. and add a little bit of context but as little as is necessary because the idea is that the image is providing the context for you we know she's not jumping off the roof as an adult like that's pretty <laughs> it's pretty evident okay yeah. right very good thank you for those uh, that clarification and the was that useful certain... yeah it is very useful thanks Daniel. appreciate it amazing and Fatima, you had some questions. We're gonna we're gonna finish off with some questions from Fatima, and then I have a question, a final question for everyone, and then we'll call it. So, Fatima, what questions can I answer for you? Thank you. I'm actually still processing your feedback from the uh, from before. I really liked what you said about the initially when you mentioned tell them what you're gonna tell them, and then you tell them, and then tell them what you told them. Um, and you said that's good for a very technical talk. I thought that was a really good feedback because when I heard that, I was like, oh, I remember when I was in university, we used that format for academic research papers, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, that really um, resonated with me. There's there's no right or wrong way of doing things. It's just a context and where they're important. So I have some um, specific questions around um, public speaking and more importantly, offers towards the end. Ooh, I yes. first feel like um, I do want to actually apologize for earlier and how I said what I said. I'm still kind of waking up oh. from my previous comment. Um, I could, I don't know, some for some reason, my words and my thoughts were not connecting. And literally, as I was saying what I was saying, I'm like, why am I saying that? <laughs> so you self corrected. It's all good. That, it that's not right. So I have been doing um, presentations. So I've done a lot of public speaking, but I'm new at wanting to. Oh, no, we just a paid oh. speaker. Right? Sorry, I missed, I missed I do your, your internet cut out for a second. Oh. So I heard you have experience oh, okay. public speaking, but? I have a lot of experience with public speaking, but I'm new as a paid speaker or okay. wanting to become a paid speaker. Um, I've done a few paid speaking, not a lot. Okay. But that's something I really want to get more into. And the part that I kind of struggle with is finding the right time and place to give my sales pitch, I feel like the the stuff that we traditionally see where people are like, this is my, you know, usual price and just today it's this. And for you, I'm like, that Run doesn't the back of the room. It doesn't feel right to me. Um, and I, I literally, I feel so gross doing that. I did that once and I was like, I'm never going to do this again. This is not who I am. I'm all about wanting to build genuine, meaningful connections. So I have been uh, doing a 30 minute press. I've done four. So I have developed a program around compassionate leadership. And what I wanted to do was do a whole bunch of 30 minute presentations on compassionate leadership, what it is and why it's important. And, you know, touching very surface level on how like what what's part of it and how to do it mm -hmm. um and I was hoping that by the end of the session it would sort of 
create some light bulbs in people's minds and say, oh, can you, I'm interested in a more in-depth training. Can you come train our team in our office? Or I'm interested in tra- this training for myself. Mm. Um, how do I go about, you know, doing this? So I've tried a variety of things. First, I tried for one presentation, I tried setting a date and time ahead of time and say, I'm going to be doing a workshop okay. um, at this time. I did not get any signups. That's also one where I had my sales pace that I did not, that yeah. just did not resonate with me at all. And I've been doing presentations in groups where generally sales pitches are not welcome either. Mm. So I just tell them, if you want to know more, just please reach out to me. Here's my contact information. Um, Or if you are looking for a a motivational speaker, please keep me in mind. But I've done four presentations now and a a 30-minute presentation and a one one hour workshop. So I've done this presentation basically five times, okay. but I'm not quite sure how to really like uh, find those paid people or people who are willing to pay for more in-depth training. Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering if I should just try in more different scenarios and different organizations to do this presentation. Mm-hmm. Or should I just not do more free 30 minute presentations now that I have enough practice on it and I've gotten some really positive feedback with it? Maybe I should just do the workshop, design a program, two, three day seminar and just sell that. This is a very complex question. (laughs) So So I'm going to do my best. No, no, it's it's good. It's a very important question. And I want to make sure that I honor that. I also want to make sure that I honor people's time and it is very close to when I said this would be over. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to answer Fatima's question. We're going to go maybe five. I'm going to do my best not to go more than 10 minutes over time because I'm going to answer Fatima's question. And then I do have a question for everybody else on the call. However, I do want to respect your time. So if you need to leave at exactly 1230, just say thank you in the chat and I'll connect with you later. I will send a follow-up email after this. So uh, we are, I am going to answer Fatima's question. We're going to go a little bit over time. I would love for you to stick around for an extra five or 10 minutes because I have a question for everyone on the call. But if you can't, I totally understand. And I will catch up with you, you know, on Facebook or, or somewhere else. So I just want to say that first before I jump into the answer. So here's the thing. <sighs> sales, sales is a complicated beast. And yeah, there's a very traditional way of selling from stage which is that kind of, you know, the offer and then you cut it down. And then, and that formula works for some people very well. The thing about sales that I have learned in my experience and in working with other people and selling in their businesses is that it sales is more of a personal, we, like, we want to think that it's a magic bullet. There's a formula and you can do it. And as soon as you've got the formula, it's done. You don't have to worry about it anymore. The truth is that the formula is different for each individual. Every person has a different sa- selling style and your market has a different buying style. And so there isn't one formula that I can tell you and teach you that's definitely gonna work. There are definitely lots of formulas out there that cater to general known things about humans. Like some humans love to buy emotionally. You know, we need to, we need to feel the pain before we, want, we feel a desire. There are, there are lots of things around that that are universally true that we can use. But when it comes to your selling style specifically, there is a lot of trial and error involved. One of the things that I would really recommend is ask your audience. So whenever you have a chance to do a survey or to, um, I work with a business coach named Grace Lever. Uh, she's based in Australia and I recommend her programs to anyone. I will, I will put a link to her. Uh, actually, Ayanna, do you know? Do you know how to spell Grace Lever? <laughs> it's anyway, it's The Doer's Way uh, by Grace Lever. I'll throw a link later. But um, I love her training because she acknowledges this, that, that everyone is different and that there are these elements that we can play around with. And the most important thing that she emphasizes is when you're building a product and when you're looking for who you're selling it to, validate your market. So if you don't know what the people you're talking about think about your offer, that's a problem. You need to talk to them. You need to ask them, you know, was I too pushy? Was I not pushy enough? 
is this something that you find valuable? Would you take it if you had the money? Is money an issue? You, there were so many questions that you need answered that you cannot answer on your own. Your market needs to tell you. And so anytime you can do a survey or if you have some favorite clients or people who've loved what you do, the workshops that you've done, take them out for lunch or you know, jump on a call for coffee and just pick their brain for a little bit. You know, Say, you know, is it okay if I just ask you some questions? I'm having a bit of trouble and I'm not quite sure where my gaps are. Your audience can tell you so much about what, what you need to adjust and what you don't need to adjust. They'll tell you what you're doing really well and they'll tell you if there's something missing. And so that is the most important thing I can say is talk to your people, talk to your market, talk to the people that, you know, if someone's asked you to come and speak, ask them, you know, what are their priorities? What are their preferences? What are their needs? The more you can communicate bef before you get to the offer. The, uh, by the time you get to the offer, all the work, all the selling work should be done. And when you get to the offer, they're already sold and it's just about logistics in a perfect world. One of the ways we do this is sharing clients, client stories and, um, you know, making sure we're relating to our audience. So there's, you know, t testimonials and things. Something that I'd be very careful with is if you are being paid to speak, typically that's not a place where you can give an offer. It's usually one or the other. Some places will let you do both, especially if the fee is reduced because they are expecting you to get business from the talk. But most of the time, if you're a paid speaker, you are not making sales on that, on that, from that talk because you have already been paid. Uh, if you're speaking for free, that's when you give the offer because the assumption is I am here giving my time in order to get leads. And so there's that exchange and making sure you're clear with whoever the event host is on that. The hardest part I think is if you are self-hosting, if you are doing these free talks, if you are self-hosting, it's as much work to get people to come to a free event as it is to get people to come to a paid event. So if you're self-hosting, do the paid one. Uh, but if you're going to speak for other people, then yeah, doing a half hour, you know, information thing where they can follow up with you afterwards is definitely the best. What I would suggest that you do is you test things out. So follow your heart, go with like, what feels best for me? What feels best for my audience? And start there, start with your instinct. Like what feels absolutely best for you? Does it feel best to give something away? Sometimes when I'm giving a talk, I don't like selling from stage. So I'll often give from stage instead. And I'll say, hey, anyone who's here as a thank you for being here, I will give you a ticket to an upcoming event that I have. And so, yeah, technically I'm losing money, but if they come to the event and they enjoy it, maybe they'll come to another event and maybe they'll become a long-term client. So for me, I think of sales more as matchmaking. If, if they're interested, I need to make it, you know, a sweet deal for them. Um, it's never convincing. Sales is not about persuading. It's not about convincing people. It's about finding the right people in the matchmaking part. So for me, I find that easier is just to give from stage or, or to give, you know, say a free consultation or something, you know. Um, if you're selling from stage, there, there does need to be more structure to it for sure. And finding that structure for yourself, I would, again, I would really recommend Grace Lever. I love the way she does things. Um, and I would really suggest, you know, going with your instinct and then adjusting. So go with your instinct and then do a survey or, or have at least two trusted people in the audience that you can ask afterwards, what were the strengths? What were the weaknesses? What can I improve? And just change one thing every time. So every time you do an offer from stage, uh, if that is what you want to do, you know, do it and then change one thing and then do it and then change one thing. Cause then it's a more scientific approach because it is just tweaking, you know? So did that answer your question? Absolutely. Thank you. So <laughs> many nuggets of wisdom in there. Really appreciate it. I especially, well, I loved it all. Um, you said Grace Lever. Yes. And actually, Ayana did put the, um, oh, yes, Ayana, you can share that the link doers to way. everybody, thedoersway.com. Yes, I see that. Thank you for that. Actually, and um, something exciting about Grace Lever is I have just signed up to um, kind of franchise to be able to teach some of her content. So look out for that. That's going to be coming up in the next couple of months. I will I'll do be doing that. Some intros for that. I will do that. Thank you so much. Really, really awesome feedback. And I, I loved 
the part where you said just follow your gut feeling and sort of sell from instinct. Yeah. I absolutely love that. That really resonates with me. The whole t- traditional sales pitch. I hate it so much. I don't buy from people who do that. So why would I do that myself? Like I, yeah. I literally, and then the other thing that was really powerful for me um, is uh, sales is about finding the right people, not trying to convince the people. I love that. Thank you so yes. much. Appreciate it. I don't know where it is at this moment. There's an amazing book called Solution Selling or Solution Based Selling. Solution. I don't know where it is, but again, I will I will find it and put it in the on the replay. It's a great book uh, talking about that. You know, it's it's never about convincing. It's just about matchmaking. Because yeah. that, that helped me so much because I also, I don't want to be sleazy. I don't want to convince people. I mm-hmm. want people to come to me if they like me and they want to work with me, you know, um, mm-hmm. and writing your passion, you know, just stay mm-hmm. plugged into what's important to you and the right people will find you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks so much, Fatima. Yay. So I have one last question, one last interactive exercise for you all. I'm going to ask everyone to turn on their camera and I'm going to go around the, I'm going to go around the room <laughs> as if we were sitting in a circle. And I'm going to ask each of you, well, first, I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much for coming. These open houses are so fun. They're wonderful for me to be able to connect with you and help you out. And I want to know from you just one of your favorite thing from this session today, this two hour session. What was your favorite thing about it? And, um, and if you have any more questions, we are going to have to close the call, but my contact information, Ayanna will throw my contact information in the chat. Um, this is being streamed live on my Facebook group. So if you have follow-up questions, I won't be able to address any more follow-up questions in this call, but do contact me. I'd love to jump on Zoom and chat with you further. I do free vocal needs assessments and unlimited stupid questions on Facebook. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to go around the room and ask everyone what they thought. And June, you are first in my view. So I'm going to ask you, June, to unmute yourself and tell us one thing you liked from today's session. Thank you for um, letting me, I mean, asking me. I would say that um, uh, the feedback that I got from everyone, not only me, from you, from their end, and their um, feedback from others and these are extremely important to me that these will add value to um, my uh, part later on in my life no matter which profession I work on on no matter where I go you know these these keywords really really helped me a lot so yeah that's my takeaway Yay! Thank hey, thanks so much June so glad to hear you found something useful absolutely <laughs> Sam you're Thank next you. on my on my screen so i'm going to ask you to unmute yourself and turn on your camera and tell us what your favorite thing was today are you here sam are you he may have stepped away for a moment sam are you here he's enjoying the flowers <laughs> he's enjoying and the, the flowers <laughs> all right sam we're going to skip over you and we'll come back to you julie you are next on my screen so i'm going to ask you what was your favorite thing about today um well the opportunity to get back on the horse so to speak because it's been a while since I've talked about this business being a student and a full-time employee for quite a while and I wanted to do some video courses and this was just a nice opportunity to get to practice that and see whether it would be more beneficial to do recorded zoom meetings or just in a in a bubble just me talking to people if I would be engaging enough for an audience if there wasn't the interaction back and forth. So yeah, so that was really beneficial to have the opportunity to practice that. And um, I appreciate your feedback as well. If I do need to look at notes, where to place the monitor and and whatnot when I'm doing that. So yeah, that, that was really helpful. Yay, I'm so glad I'm getting your toes back in, Julie. Yeah. It's wonderful. <laughs> Steve, you're next on my screen. Can I ask you what your favorite thing was about today? Well, thank you. Yeah, I joined a little bit late, but I think the, the main point was, you know, knowing your purpose of your talk is going to be you know, very important in terms of how you 
what opening you use, that was my specific question, but actually Fatima's question uh, last here about selling and whether or not you're selling your story or selling your message or selling it for a fee. It's that, what is it for the audience and the whole solution idea or the call to action? So keeping that in mind foremost to me is pretty important. And uh, right from the outset of a speech, having clarity on that seems okay. really important. Yeah. We're always selling, even when we're not getting money from someone, we're selling an idea, we're selling something. We're selling a message, absolutely. Thanks so much, Steve. And Fatima, something that you're next on my screen, so something that you, your favorite thing from today? Um, I really liked, uh, I didn't get to watch everyone's presentations, I wish I'd uh, come in sooner, but I, my highlight was I, I really loved your feedback for all the different presentations. Um, I, I really like your feedback because it's very practical and it's very down to earth. It's never superficial. Uh, it's never like surface level cookie cutter textbook. And it, it's, it's practical. And I also, I don't seek advice from everybody. Um, I'm very particular about whose advice I take. And yours is one that I really take to heart because I know it comes from genuine experience um, and, and there's always a lot of context and there's depth to your advice and I appreciate that thank you oh, oh thanks so much Fatima that's very sweet I'm, and it means a lot to me because practical is just huge on my list of priorities as a as a student as well as as a as an instructor I'm like if it's not used if it's not practical why are you telling me you know <laughs> so I'm so glad that that came through thanks so much Fatima and we've got Roy, you just came on right at the end of the call, but do you have anything that you'd like to say? <laughs> Thanks for joining us. You can unmute yourself. All right, there we are. <clears throat> Hi, how are you? Hi, good, nice to see you. Oh, uh, good. Uh, yeah, I was, you know, I, I was gonna give you my reason why I'm late. I was always on some important phone calls there, but it seems like everybody else is uh, giving the same, you know, coming in a little bit late. Um, but yeah, I, I really came on, I just wanted to uh, see and listen. I really didn't have a, a, a topic that I wanted to address or something that I really wanted to get feedback on. But I mean, I do stand up comedy, so I'm always on stage and I'm always talking to people, but you know, you can always get better. You can always hear some tips. You can always hear some information that'll help you to convey your message to the audience or to get, or finding out ways of getting feedback Mm -hmm. and and really sort of just you know fighting because I do a lot of improvisation when I do my comedy so it's not just me doing straight material I'm also in, you know interacting with the audience and I use that interaction to get to another joke that I'm doing so everything seems like it's just organic and just building between me and this person where I could be doing the joke for 20 years but it doesn't seem that way cool uh, so yeah and so it, again I just wanted to come out and listen and hear what people are saying and see what tips I can, you know, pick up even just for myself. Amazing. Well, thanks so much for joining us. If you missed the beginning, the replay will be on Facebook and also on my YouTube channel. I will send out the link after the call so you can catch up on anything you missed. I just want to say I am in awe of anyone who does stand-up comedy. I have a couple <laughs> of clients who do stand-up comedy and I just think, whoo, you are amazing. I, you know, I did, I did acting, but like theater acting, and I've never had the guts to do stand-up comedy because the amount of thinking on your feet you have to do and the amount of ownership and commitment you have to have to the, the timing and you know that kind of thing is really amazing. So good it's for you. you. It's all you. <laughs> <laughs> amazing. Well, thanks so much for joining us, Roy. Thanks for having me. And Clara, I'm gonna ask you one thing you liked from today. So uh, I really like listening to everybody and what topics they're bringing forward and how they're bringing it forward and everything that that's that's interesting and obviously I like to hear the comments that you're making to each person because it's also being helpful and as far as I'm concerned I like uh, how you're teaching me how to breathe and how to progressively um, get my voice more grounded so it can project better. Um, so that's it. Thank you so much, Danielle, for your help as usual. Thank you so much, Clara. And Ayana, I want to ask you one thing that you liked from today, but I also just want to thank you so much. And everyone just let's 
thank, we can't really clap, but like pretend clap for Ayanna for moderating, for figuring out your speaking spots and, you know, doing all that stuff so that I could be present with you and coaching you and talking to you. And she did all the magic backstage. So thank you so much, Ayanna. It would be really hard to do this without you. <laughs> so thank you so much for being here. And uh, did you, is there anything you wanted to say to just close us up? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, you're welcome. Uh, <laughs> um, I I guess I, I do have a I do have a, a favorite moment. Um, I guess while you were doing your uh, while you were giving uh, some feedback to Julie, uh, I really appreciated you briefly touching on um, uh, how important it is to be vulnerable in order to break the tension and to admit when you're feeling nervous or scared or you know, you made a mistake and to just, you know, it's not as scary as it seems. So, mm. yeah. I love that. And mm -hmm. this is, that's a beautiful message to end on. One of my favorite teachers, uh, Larry Silverberg, who teaches the, at the True Acting Institute is his, uh, is his business. He teaches the Meisner Technique and I, I'm certified to teach Meisner Technique through the True Acting Institute with Larry. And something that he says, he has all these little memes that he teaches with, you know, he has these things that he says over and over to get it into your brain. And one of the things that he says all the time, which is not only important to me in my acting practice, but also in my speaking practice and also in my life and in my relationships is he says, embrace everything, deny nothing. And I use that in my public speaking. I use that in my relationships the moment we're in denial, the moment we're trying to pretend reality doesn't exist, we're going to disconnect from our audience. We're going to break their trust. We're going to create miscommunications with our loved ones. We have to embrace everything. We have to acknowledge the reality, however unpleasant it is, that I have forgotten what to say next, or that I have misunderstood something, or that I've said the wrong word. I have to embrace that first before I can move on and fix it or adjust. I can't pretend it didn't happen. It, I cannot change reality. And so that saying, embrace everything, deny nothing, that Larry Silverberg said to me more than 10 years ago, and it's still rattling around in my brain, and I use it all the time. When we're as speakers, we have to embrace what's going on, whatever. If there's someone talking on their cell phone at the back of the room, we have to acknowledge that. It has to become part of our reality, and then we can move forward and change it. But if we don't acknowledge it, if we don't embrace it, we can't, we have no control over it. And so to embrace when I've forgotten my words or if I'm nervous or whatever distracting things are going on, embrace it first and then we can move on from there. And that is how I'm gonna leave you today. Thank you all so much for coming. I had a great time. I hope you had a great time. The replay will be on the Facebook group as well as on the YouTube channel. And I will send you an email with all of the relevant links in the next 24 to 48 hours. Have a wonderful weekend. I'll see you soon. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye. Bye.